All right, if you have your Bibles, I want you to open up to the book of Malachi. Okay, what now? Malachi. It's spelled Malachi. Okay, once you've gotten to the book of Malachi, I want you to turn to the end of the book of Malachi. Chapter 4 is the last chapter. Get to the end of the book. Now, for those of you that are using electronic devices, this is not going to be a good visual representation for you. But for those of you using the old paper stuff, what happens at the end of Malachi? Yeah, we got a paper that says the New Testament. But between Malachi and the New Testament, a huge amount of things happen. It's called the 400 years of silence. Okay? Because in the Protestant church, we do not believe that there were any inspired writings between Malachi and the Gospels. People call it the, the years that God was silent. 400 years of silence. God was not silent. He was very active. He was very busy. We are continuing in our series on the feasts, but I'm breaking the order a little bit today. Does anybody know what began earlier this week? What feast? We're right in the middle of a feast. Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. Hanukkah. Um, if you notice, I brought up here this morning. Does anybody know what this is? Menorah. A menorah. All right, Angie, Steve, you're not allowed to answer. <laughs> Does anyone know what this is? Hanukkah. A what? Hanukkah. Hanukkah. What's the difference? Hanukkah. Ugh! This one's heavier. <laughs> One is set on seven, one is set on nine, okay? The menorah is the lamp that was put in the uh, temple in the outer room, okay? The Hanukkah is not it. It's something different. The Hanukkah, just as the name implies, is used to celebrate Hanukkah, all right? So we have both. We like both because both of them serve a specific purpose. This is a menorah, this is a Hanukkah. Um, for those of you that will be following along on the notes that I put up, well, actually, I guess, wait a minute, I put them backwards. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> Whew. Um, Hanukkah, I, I, seriously, I found like six different ways to spell Hanukkah. This is the way I'm spelling it. Okay, if you spell it different, that's okay. So long as we both understand, we're talking about the same thing. Okay, so what, is, what does Hanukkah mean? Hmm? Go, ahead and, go ahead and put the first slide up, if you would, please. Hanukkah means the Feast of Dedication. It actually just means dedication. Okay, dedication. We're going to get into why this feast came about, what inspired it, and, and, and to get there we have to cover kind of a, quite a bit of history. But um, these are the scriptures that talk about the celebration of Hanukkah, or Hanukkah. So go ahead and go to the next one. Yeah, there aren't any. <laughs> Not directly. But there are quite a few that speak to this feast, this festival, indirectly. There, now there are two names by which this feast is known. The first is Hanukkah, that means dedication. <clears throat> the second one, go ahead and go forward. Oh yeah, by the way, I used Old Testament on purpose because um, we do not look at the books that come in the middle, the apocryphal books, and the Protestant church, we do not look at those as inspired of God. Now in Jewish Bibles, 
And in Catholic Bibles, you will find, in most cases, the Apocrypha. These are the books that fall in between Malachi and Matthew. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But I'm, I'm saying the Old Testament because in the Protestant church, we do not have those middle books. We don't believe that they are inspired of God. The Jews do not believe that they are inspired of God either. They, they actually refer to them uh, as books that are not harmful for reading. Okay? But that's a very delicate way to put it. So, uh, go ahead and go on to the next slide. Uh, the first name is Hanukkah, which means dedication. Uh, the second one, Hag HaOrem, is the uh, festival of lights, or the feast of lights. Okay, most people, when they hear Hanukkah, they think of the lights, the feast of lights, or the festival of lights. Hanukkah actually means dedication. Okay, and, and then Hag HaOrem, that means the Feast of Lights. And we're going to talk about both of those and how they apply to this feast. Okay? Now, you're going to have to bear with me because i got to wade through quite a bit of stuff to get us to where we need to pay attention today. Okay? We need to understand where all this stuff came from because God said it was going to happen. Say what now? Um, God spoke through the prophet Daniel. And he gave two prophecies that we're going to see were filled point for point in that intertestamental period, the, the years of silence, um, that, that came to pass. So let's go, go ahead and go to the next one. Um, before we go very far into this, I'm going to be talking about these prophecies and how they were fulfilled. But I believe that many prophecies given in Scripture have a near fulfillment and a far fulfillment. Okay? Because in these prophecies, we're going to read about something called the abomination that causes desolation. Okay? And we see that this, this abomination occurred about 167 B.C. But some 135, 167, about 190 years later, we see that Jesus says again, uh, when you see the abomination which causes desolation. So I believe there is a near fulfillment that Daniel was speaking to that, that was fulfilled in the intertestamental period. But I believe there is a far fulfillment that is yet to come. Because what happened before is going to happen again, but it's going to happen at the end of things. Okay? So when I'm talking about these things and you go, well, I've heard a lot of teaching that this is talking about the stuff in Revelation. Yeah, you probably have. And yeah, it is probably very correct because Revelation repeats a lot of things that come right out of Daniel's visions. Okay? So was, was uh, John just... You know, plagiarizing? No, I think God was trying to reiterate some significant events that are coming. Okay? So, when we're talking about these prophecies fulfilled now, this is the near fulfillment. There will be more of this that will be fulfilled in times yet to come. And, and actually, some of this was repeated again in 70 AD with the fall of Jerusalem. But we'll, we'll touch on that briefly later. So going forward, bear with me. Okay? Uh, if you have your... Bibles, turn to Daniel chapter 8. <clears throat> there are two passages that we're going to look at today. Um, I would encourage you. I would really hope that uh, you guys would take a look at these prophecies. Take a look at history and see how point for point some of these prophecies were fulfilled in the intertestamental period. Today we're going to be talking about um, Antiochus IV. We're going to be talking about the Hasmoneans. We're going to be talking about the Maccabees. And we're probably hoping that the, this kind of glazed look that you just got over your eyes as I said all those things will go away. Okay, because in this intertestamental period, God was not inactive. God was very active. He was moving to set the stage 
for the arrival of his son, for the great deliverer that was to come. And he did some incredible things in this 400 year span that, that literally reshaped the entire face of the known world. Okay? So, in the book of Daniel, chapter 8, we're going to go down, uh, skip down with me to uh, verse... Um, Let's see. The, the problem is there's so much here that deals with this. I want to pull out just the particular verses. Um, let's start in 18, and we'll read a little bit more than I had intended. In verse 18, Daniel had seen a vision, and he was looking to understand it. Okay, He's trying to figure out, okay, what does this mean? Okay. Um, in verse 18, okay, uh, right prior to verse 18, Gabriel shows up. Everybody know Gabriel? Okay. Archangel. Uh, Gabriel. Scripture doesn't ever actually refer to him as the archangel. The messenger. But a lot of Christianity thinks that he is one of the archangels because he's the only, there's only three angels that are specifically named through scripture. Okay? And he's one of them. So, so sometimes people go, well, yeah, because we know that Lucifer uh, took one third of the angels with him when he fell and there's only two other named and that's Michael and Gabriel. Michael and Gabriel. Okay? But um, Gabriel, when we see Gabriel coming, he's always bringing a message. He's always coming to tell us something. All right. Um, unlike Michael, who is an angel of few words and an angel of action, Gabriel is, is kind of the proclaimer. He's the, the messenger. So in 18 it says, And when he had spoken to me, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and made me stand up. You notice it doesn't say he woke him up. He just touched him and made him stand up. Um, I know this is possible. My wife does it every morning. <laughs> She gets up and she spends about an hour functioning before she wakes up. She has an incredible gift to do that. Um, because That's why she gets up an hour before me. Because she doesn't want me to wake her up. So she gets up early because when I wake up, I'm as awake as I'm ever going to be throughout the day as soon as my eyes open. She takes a little longer. Okay. So he stood up. Okay, he, being Gabriel, said, Behold, I will make known to you what shall be at the latter end of the indignation, for it refers to the appointed time of the end. Okay, now he's going to go back. He's going to describe the vision and what it means. As for the ram that you saw with two horns, these were the kings of Media and Persia. And the goat is the king of Greece. And the great horn between his eyes is the first king. As for the horn that was broken in place of which four, four, four others arose, four kingdoms shall arise from this nation, but not with his power. But at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king of bold face, one who understands riddles, shall arise. His power shall be great, but not by his own power, and he shall cause fearful destruction, and shall succeed in what he does, and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints." By his cunning he shall make the seat prosper under his hand, and in his own mind he shall become great. Without warning he shall destroy many, and he shall rise up against the prince of princes, and he shall be broken, but by no human hand. The vision of the evenings and the mornings has been told, uh, that has been told is true, but seal up the vision, for it refers to many days from now. And I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for some days. Then I rose and went about the king's business, but I was appalled by the vision and did not understand it. Okay, now, there's a couple things I want to draw your attention to real quick. The first thing is, uh, Gabriel says these are the things that will come at the end days. See, I think that he's speaking of the far fulfillment of this prophecy. But if you look um, historically, we know that at the time of Daniel, the Assyrians had risen to power, they had fallen. Babylon had risen to power, and they had fallen. And now the, the, the joined nations of the Medes and the Persians had risen to power, and they're going to fall. Now, if we, we project 
a few uh, decades into the future, and actually for us it's looking way back, a king arose in Greece, and actually, actually he's from Macedonia, and by the name of Alexander. He succeeded his father, Philip, and he united all the tribes in, in Macedonia. They went down, they conquered all of Greece, and Alexander then set out on a path of conquest that took him from Greece all the way up through modern day Turkey, down through uh, Syria, through Israel, down into Egypt. Then they went up, they headed east, they went through Iraq, Iran, they hit parts of Afghanistan, even as far as parts of India. Okay, this is the goat with the great horn. It was um, Alexander who destroyed the power of the Medes and the Persians, although at this point, the Medes had kind of fallen out and the Persians were really the ones that were the power, the world power at the time. Um, there are estimates that when they fielded their army, uh, that we know that at, at least a couple times they had close to a million men. And, and yet, Alexander and the Greeks came and they annihilated every army that was sent at them. They ended up throwing down the Persian power. Um, Alexander set up his eastern uh, capital in Babylon and, and then a couple other places and yet at the height of his power 32 years old okay he did all of this stuff before the age of 32 I get up in the morning and I feel like I've done a lot if I get my shoes on the right feet <laughs> at 32 he has conquered all of that and then he dies okay there's the goat with the horn and then at the height of its power, the horn is broken. And out come four more horns. Okay? Four more horns. Now, when Alexander died, his generals waged war to see who was going to inherit, who was going to take over his kingdom. What ended up happening is they settled uh, with four different kingdoms. Uh, there was uh, one of the generals, I believe it was Cassandra, was up in Greece and, and he was basically the European and part of, of uh, Turkey and then there was, I can't remember the name of the general that took off uh, the Far East, he had part of India, uh, Afghanistan, uh, part of Iran and then there's two of them that need, we need to focus on, uh, Seleucus, uh, he was the general that took over the area that included Israel, okay, and then down to the south in Egypt, there was a king, uh, the, the general's name was Ptolemy. Uh, now, a period of time goes by, and out of the Seleucids arises a general. Um, go ahead and, and go forward a little bit. I'm going to see. Um, go ahead and go forward. Um, okay, stop right there. Um, a, a period of time goes by, and a king arises out of the Seleucid uh, kingdom. His name is Antiochus IV. Okay? Um, this king arose, and he was not content with his lot. Uh, over the course of time, his kingdom had been diminished. They were losing some of their ground in the east. They were losing some of their ground to the south. Uh, he, when he came to his kingship, he decided he'd had enough. He raised armies. He took back land to the east. Um, and then he set his eyes on, on Ptolemy in Egypt, okay? And we know that um, he assaulted Egypt at least twice, okay? Um, let's flip over to 11 because we're going to see some things. Uh, Daniel chapter 11. We're going to see some things here that are further openings, further prophecies to this specific time period, okay? Um, <clears throat> I would encourage you to read this entire chapter to get the understanding of what's going on. Um, I'm just going to kind of summarize this for you. In this passage, there are two kings that are waging war. Um, the king of the south and the king of the north. Um, of these two kings, well, there will be a king in the north who will grow up and he will do many things. He will deceive many people. He will win his power through um, 
uh, negotiation, through deceit, through trickery, and then he will raise an army and he will wage war against the king of the south, but he will not be victorious, he will, he will be defeated, he will retreat to the north, he will raise another army and he'll come down and he'll be defeated again. Um, we know that in two periods, about 168 BC, Antiochus IV, who dubbed himself Antiochus IV Epiphanes. You go, Epipha what? And not Epiphany like you had a revelation. Epiphany in the Greek means um, manifest God. Okay, so this king arose and he took the name for himself, I am God among you. Does that sound familiar? It's the Greek version of Emmanuel. I, I, here I am, I'm a God. And he set about um, changing everything to his liking. Now, one of the things that we need to understand that was hugely significant in this intertestamental period is when the Greeks conquered, they didn't just beat people militarily, they beat them at the culture game. They instituted a, a process that we, was called Hellenization. It's basically, the, the Greeks were called the Hellens, okay? Uh, because of Helen of Troy, which actually she wasn't from Troy, she was from Greece, and anyway, that's a different story, but they, they're, they're known as Hellens, okay? And um, so when they came in and they conquered, their army would move on to other conquests, but they would leave behind people, and other people would come in that would teach Greek thinking. Now, the Greeks were great thinkers. You look back at some of the, the um, things that they came up with. A lot of our math is based on things that they developed. A lot of our logic is based on things that they developed. Western thinking, how you and I think, is based off of Greek thinking. Okay, And it's very, very different than Eastern thinking. We like to look at numbers, we like to look at information, we like to exchange data and, and think logically. Whereas in the Eastern, they, they tend to think more, um, for lack of a better word, I would say mystically. They tend to see things deeper than what we say. If I tell you, this is a cup of water, what do you receive? What, what, what do you understand this to be? a cup of water. But if I tell somebody in the East that I have a cup of water, they're looking for the deeper meaning behind that. My meaning is, being Western, I'm very simple, I got a cup of water and you don't. <laughs> but, but in the East, we see that there is a, an entirely different thinking, which is part of why so much of the scripture is difficult for us to understand because we are looking at it on this plane. And the writer who wrote it and the person, the target audience that he wrote for are thinking on an entirely different level. Okay? Which is why we look at things and we go, oh, we, we try and fit them into these neat categories. How many of you have drawn up, at some point in your Bible studies, you've drawn up a chart, a timeline of the book of Revelation? <laughs> Come on, don't be shy. That's because we're Western thinkers. Okay? If most people in Eastern thinking, they're not going to try and draw, draw a chart. They realize that it's not necessarily a linear thing. But in Western thinking, we, we think linearly. Okay? So, um, this process was to come in and to just begin to show them all that the Greek culture had to offer. Big deal, right? Yeah, it was because it completely changed the face of Jerusalem. Because when the, the Greeks came in and the Greek culture came in, a lot of the Jews started shifting who they were and what they were to be more like the Greeks. I mean, what, wouldn't you want to be like the people that were in charge? I mean, they, they, they actually came in and they defeated us and, and they've left us our, our customs, they've left us our religion, but look at all that they've got. I mean, look at these, these things that they've built and, and their thinking and their logic and, and all of this. And, and so a lot of the, the Hebrews, a lot of the Jews, actually kind of fell under this Hellenization process. Okay? Now, why is this significant? It's significant because God was putting into play setting up the stage for the arrival of his son. Okay? Because part of this process of Hellenization is that years later when Christ was born, you could travel from 
the, the Great Britain Isles, all the way around through Europe, down through Turkey, all the way down through Syria, and over into Egypt. And you could travel points east of there and speak one language and be understood. Greek became the common language. It was the business of trade. It was the business of government. So if you could speak, you speak your language, your dialect there, but if you spoke Greek, you could be understood and understand others. Okay, that's huge because when Scripture was written, although parts of it were originally written in Aramaic, it was translated or, or written in Greek. And so the writers in Jerusalem that could write, they, their writings would be understood in Spain. That's huge, folks. We don't think a big deal of it because we go from California to New York, and even though it's kind of weird sounding, it's still English. Well, the English don't like us to say that because it's not English. It's American, right? So, but, but for, think of all the different countries that run through that area. And for one language to be spoken through all of them was huge, okay? So the, the stage is being set. Back to these two kings, about 168 B.C., Antiochus raises an army and he goes down to conquer Egypt. Now we know that at the, the outset of the campaign, he succeeded greatly. He gathered great wealth and plunder, but then he was stopped partway through his invasion and was turned back. Now when he came back, uh, at some point during this war, word came to Jerusalem that Antiochus was killed. Now Antiochus, when he became king, he stripped the high priesthood from Onias, who was the high priest at the time, and he gave it to one of his brothers, and this brother was a, a sick man, um, uh, he was not right in the head. He was very Hellenized. He was in cahoots with the Greeks. And, and, but he wasn't enough, so Antiochus stripped it away from him and gave it to a third brother named Menelaus. Now Menelaus was a Greek-appointed high priest. Uh, you know from Scripture that the high priest has to come from the line of Aaron. Okay, so uh, this, this uh, while he may be of the line of Aaron, he does not have the right to be appointed by a foreign power to be high priest. And we see from this period on, the priesthood takes uh, goes through some pretty serious changes. All right. Well, when, when Jerusalem hears that Antiochus is dead, they oust Menelaus. <laughs> You're not our high priest. Hit the road. And they put back uh, Onias. Well, Antiochus comes in and he sees that the, the Jews, they're trying to put everything back. And he's furious. He's lost. Uh, he comes back to find the people that are behind him, betraying him. Uh, he sets out on a, a pogrom. He kills 80,000 Jews. He enslaved 40,000 more. He goes back into the temple. He strips the high priesthood, kicks him out. High priest Onias ends up being uh, murdered. Menelaus comes in, but, but he doesn't. he's not satisfied with those changes. He starts to implement a series of rules. Uh, among these rules were the fact that they could no longer celebrate the Sabbath. Anybody caught celebrating the Sabbath was, was the potential was death. He goes into the temple and on the brazen altar where the sacrifices are offered, he sacrifices a pig. Okay. He then raises up an altar to Zeus in the courtyard of the temple. He forbids the priest from doing the, their Levitical, their, their, their Mosaic law duties, they're not allowed to offer their sacrifices. The, Jew, or the, the Greek soldiers are coming in. They, they have the temple prostitutes now in the actual temple, temple with capital T, and, and they, they defile the temple. They profane it. We talked about this. When God makes something holy, He pulls it out and He makes it separate. He takes it out of the common, the profane. Well, when they brought the common in, they profaned the temple. Okay? Um, one of the other things that he forbid was babies were no longer, baby boys were no longer allowed to be circumcised. If a mother was caught with a circumcised male child, the child was killed and hung around her neck. And she had to carry the child with her as a, a sign of her breaking the law. And then after a period of time, she was then killed as well. Uh, any, any priest caught doing circumcision was killed. 
uh, he required them to eat pork. Um, he, he knew, and, and the satanic mind that he had, he knew what to strike at to completely destroy the Jewish understanding, the Jewish culture. Okay, so 167, um, go ahead and go forward a little bit here. <clears throat> go ahead and go forward, I've, I've touched on that. One more? Go ahead, one more, okay. We've talked about Antiochus IV, um, Kislev 25, 167 BC, the month of Kislev, that's winter. Um, the 25th is the day that he goes in and he sacrifices the pig. That's the date that they look at and they go, this is the abomination of desolation uh, when, when the, the temple was profaned and it was no longer holy. So go ahead and go to the next one. Uh, town of Modi'in. Uh, it's northwest of Jerusalem. Um, there lived a family there uh, of the, the Hasmon family. Uh, whose fa the father was Matthias. Um, he was a priest. He was highly respected. And as, as part of this pogrom, <clears throat> the Greeks would come into a town and they would require one of the town elders to sacrifice a pig to Zeus. And because Matthias was a, a very well-respected Jew, a very well-respected man of the thing, they called him out to sacrifice the pig. He refused. Okay. Um, you guys don't understand what that meant because when people refused to do the sacrifice they were tortured to make an example of them and then killed uh, there was a, a I can't remember the gentleman's name he was 90 years old he refused to make the sacrifice and and he was killed for standing his ground there was she's called the mother of five uh, there was a woman who refused to, to do what the Greeks required of her, so they killed each of her five sons before her. And before they could kill her, rather than submitting herself to their rule, she threw herself off of a cliff. Um, so you, you see this is a horrific <coughs> time in Israel. So um, now we have two groups that developed at this time, and eventually they became two of the, the um, religious sects we have those that sided with the Greeks, that, that appreciated and accepted all that the Greeks brought in. And, and of that group, those that were Hellenized were drawn the Sadducees, okay? The Sadducees. They're the ones that, that agreed with the thinking of the Greeks. Now, we know that they, they didn't violate necessarily the law, but they, they kind of had an end with the Greeks. And as such things went better for them, okay? The, things went well for them. And then when, when the other religious folks saw this and, and they rejected it, they formed their own party, okay? Uh, they, they called themselves the righteous and, and those were the Pharisees and that's where those two parties sprung from. And you see those in, in the New Testament and the Gospels. <clears throat> the uh, Sadducees, Held, held positions of authority in Jerusalem, specifically in the temple. The Pharisees, they were the, the faith, the, the group of the people. Okay, so when we look at things in Scripture, some of the things are done according to the Sadducees' way of thinking. Other things are done according to the Pharisees' ways of thinking. And this can lead to what looks like conflict. Because we go, well, wait a minute, how can it be this and this? It depended who the group was doing it at the time, okay? Because the Sadducees controlled the temple, they got to declare when the days were, the high days. And the Pharisees, though, they got to, to have the influence over the people. Okay, so those two, two parties arose. Now, one of the Hellenized party in the, the town stepped forward to make the sacrifice. We have no idea what this man was thinking. He, he may have been thinking, hey, if somebody doesn't do it, they're going to wipe out everybody. So I'm going to do this and, and just save everybody. Uh, or he could have been like, yeah, I have a problem with this. Kill the pig, eat some bacon, a ham sandwich. You know, we, we don't know what he was thinking. But he stepped forward to do the sacrifice. And Matthias rose up and killed him. Now Matthias had five sons. And between him and the sons, they killed the Greek soldiers that were in, uh, in Modi'in. 
And this began the Maccabean Revolt. Now, in the intertestamental books, there are two books called the First and Second Maccabees. We do not believe these are divinely inspired books, but they are history books. They tell us some of the things that went on in that period between Malachi and Matthew. All right? Some of these writings have other people that have attested to the veracity of them, um, but some of them we don't know. We, uh, do we take them at their word? We don't know. Um, but we know there were five sons. Uh, they were called the Maccabees after uh, the third son, um, who Maccabee just means the hammer. Okay, and they called the third son, they called him the hammer because he never gave up. He kept hammering at the Greeks. Uh, so this, this rebellion starts in Modi'in, and then it spreads all throughout Israel. We know that there were at least two armies that Antiochus sent to quell the uprising. We know both of them were defeated, um, miraculously so, because you have the Jews who were not... Um, really trained in, in warfare like the Greeks were. I mean, you're talking about armies that conquered everything from Greece to India. And then you have the Jews. And, and yet, on two occasions, the armies were sent against them and they defeated them. Okay? That right there should get your attention because God was still working in Israel. Alright? So, in 164 B.C., uh, they finally overthrew Antiochus. He had enough. He pulled back out of Israel. There were still some, some places that, that were kept by the Greeks, but overall, Antiochus pulled his hands back. Okay? He, he, he got out of the way. In 164 B.C., they went to cleanse the temple. Okay? The temple had been profaned. They couldn't offer sacrifice on the brazen altar because it had been profaned. They tore the, the bronze altar down. They rebuilt a new one. They, they tore the idol out. They rededicated the temple to the service of God. Now, the, the date that it was dedicated was the 25th of Kislev, 164 B.C. Three years to the day from the time it was profaned, it was made holy again. Now, in the process of dedicating the temple, they went to light the menorah in the, the holy place. And they only had sufficient oil for one day. Now, tradition said, this is tradition that speaks. The history books of the time don't talk about this. But some of the rabbinic writings refer back to it. So, whether this happened or whether it didn't is not the point. The Jews think it happened. The Jews say it happened, okay? So they, they needed eight days to process the oil to make it holy so that it could be offered in, in the menorah, in the temple. They only had sufficient oil for one day, okay? Um, whether it was the divine intervention or, or what, uh, the Jews believe that God stretched that oil for the full eight days, okay? the full eight days. Now when we say Hanukkah, they dedicated a feast specifically to the dedication of the temple. That's the Hanukkah. But it also becomes known as Hag HaOram Orem to, to be the festival of lights because the light stayed lit for eight days. So when you look at the menorah, this is what was lit and stayed lit for eight days, not this one. I wish. <laughs> no, I don't, because I don't want it here. Um, but but it, this was what was lit for eight days. But they created the Hanukkah to represent the eight days. We go, well, how many are here? How many? Nine. Okay, nine. But it was only eight days. Well, the Jews being Jews... They couldn't let well enough alone. They took a very simple feast and they complicated it. Okay? If you look in your bulletin, there's an insert I stuck in here. You can read this at your leisure. The Jews came up with 24 rabbinic laws as to how to celebrate the feast. 
You're going to party? This is how you party. Okay? And they had things in there, like you, the, the, the Hanukkah, your candles, were supposed to be outside your door so everybody would know that you were celebrating. It had to be to the left side, and it had to be no less than three feet off the ground because if it was lower, people might not see it. And you couldn't put it above 35 feet above the ground because then it would be too high and people might not see it. So you had to go in that range. And, and if you were um, um, out of town, you still had to light your candle, but, but back at home, Mama had to light the candle for you. And, and if you couldn't afford your candle or you couldn't get a candle, but you were staying with someone that had the candle, you had to pay them a coin to represent that one of those candles was yours so you didn't violate Hanukkah. And, and, and just take a look at those rules and, and you go, these people were serious about this. This was big stuff to them. But they took eight for the days of the candles and then the servant candle. This is the one that lights the others. Okay? They had a very specific process. You went from one side to the other in adding the candle so you would light on one day the first candle on the first day and then the second day you would add a candle to it but you're adding the candles from one side to the other but when you light them you light them from the other side to the one okay. <laughs> Ow. really I would be so caught up in the minutia of not violating the law I would not have fun you weren't allowed to fast during these eight days because it's a feast. Yeah? You were not, and that was a violation of the rabbinic law. So take a look at those and you'll see how they, they kind of took this thing and they, they went way out. Go ahead and, and come forward a little bit. <clears throat> so see, when, when you're looking in the scripture, you're not going to see where God says, this is a feast. And yet the Jews made it a feast. Is that a bad thing? Not necessarily. There's nowhere in Scripture where God says, these are the feasts, you have no more. This is it. <laughs> Done. He doesn't say that. So they're not violating a law by putting this in there. But doesn't his Scripture also say, don't add to? And, and so they're adding a day. Okay, that's not a problem. But then they add laws that you can't violate to celebrate that day. God didn't give them those laws. God didn't tell them that you had to act this way at this time for this purpose. So, so in their zeal, they started adding to the Word of God. We've talked about that before and, and we'll probably talk about it again. Okay, So this was not a feast given of God, but it is still con considered a feast. Um, go ahead and go to the next one. These are some of the components that are required for celebrating Hanukkah. Um, let me catch up in my notes here. We'll go through these pretty quickly. Uh, one, the lampstand. Uh, the more menorah was changed to the Hanukkah for this event only. Um, the servant candle, the, the one that I talked about, either has to be above or off to the side of the other eight. Okay? I don't know why. Number two, the service of the kindling of the lamps. This was broken up into three parts. They did a blessing before the ceremony. They did a blessing after the kindling that where they lit the candle. And then they did the singing of the special song. The song is called Mount Zur. I don't know if that's right. It's, it's, it literally means Rock of Ages. And it, it's a series of stanzas. Each one given to a specific point in the history of Israel. The one talking about the dedication of the temple. One talking about their deliverance from Egypt. And, and these are part of this part of the ceremony. And you do this each Hanukkah. Okay. Uh, number three, prayers. There are three prayers that are recited each day. The al Nasim, which is the concerning of miracles. The Hallel, which is Psalms 113 to 118. And the... The Anna Bahoak, which is a mystic Kabbalistic prayer that um, means strength. Okay, so you would say these prayers. Uh, number four, scripture readings. Uh, Exodus 40, the, the, the dedication of the tabernacle is taken from the law and they would read this. And then from the book of the prophets, Zechariah, 
The entire book is read. So is 1 Kings. Um, and from the writings is read Psalm 33, Psalm 67, Psalm 90, Psalm 91, Psalm 133. Are you guys having fun yet? <laughs> Number five, other readings. Okay, so we've gone through the process. The other readings are 2 Maccabees chapter 7, Hannah and her seven sons, and the book of Judith are all read. Okay? You know, Christmas morning we get up and we open presents. Christy makes her cinnamon rolls. Um, we stay in jammies most of the day until people might show up. And, and then typically uh, when the kids were younger, because they always got up early, we'd go out, we'd open presents, we'd eat a, a cinnamon roll and then go back to bed. <laughs> We don't do that anymore because the kids have all moved out except for Thaddeus and he doesn't get up all that early. So, um, we, in the Vano family, we have a tradition. My father used to read the Christmas story every Christmas Eve. Um, before he passed away, we recorded him reading the Christmas story. So we watched the recording Christmas Eve. Um, you know, that's, that's about the extent of our traditions and eggnog. Somewhere in there is going to be eggnog. Yes. Okay. Um, that's about it. And, and none of those are we legalistic about. The kids are adamant about, but we're not legalistic about. So, so you see this feast is a, a serious thing. Um, let's go forward. Um, I'm going to try. I'm, I'm actually going to hit just a couple things real fast. What, what does this have to do with us? Okay. What, so, so what, Pastor Glenn? You've wasted time today. I'm not wasting your time. Because it's hugely significant. In John chapter 8, Jesus is in Jerusalem. And he's talking to the people. And he calls himself the light of the world. Okay? He says, I am the light of the world. Now, you read through chapter 8. You read through chapter 9. You get into chapter 10. Okay, in chapter 10, we find that Jesus is in the temple. Now, at no point in between 8, 9, and 10 do we find that he left Jerusalem and came back. I think this was all a, a series of days in Jerusalem. But if you turn to John chapter 10, verse 22. Uh, go ahead and flip over there real quick. Um, we see, <clears throat> at that time... So Jesus is in Jerusalem. He's actually in the temple. He says, At the time the Feast of Dedication took place in Jerusalem, it was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. <clears throat> okay, the Feast of Dedication, that's Hanukkah. Jesus is at the temple. He is celebrating the Festival of Lights, the Feast of Dedication. Jesus is celebrating this feast that man made. They made it to honor what God had done because He did some incredible things. He delivered them. And, and then the miracle of the oil. He did incredible things. I don't think God looked at that and went, oh, really? My feasts aren't enough? You've got to have another? Jesus, who being in very nature God, celebrated. Okay? So, we, we see... That he says, I am the light of the world. And at no point between then and here do we see that he left Jerusalem. I think he was speaking directly to this feast. Because remember, the feast was eight days long. Eight days. And I think he's, he's looking at this festival of lights. And, and he's, t he's using that as an illustration. Saying, I am the light. And I'm not just the light here. I'm the light of the world. Okay? You go, oh, okay, that, that's cool. That's, that's, that kind of gives us a little bit of connection. But we're not Jewish. So what does that mean to us? Well, who wrote the book of John? John. John. All right. Turn to 1 John. Jump all the way to the end. Let's go to 1 John. Go ahead and, uh, there we go. <clears throat> so, I lost my Bible.
<clears throat> so we're in the book of 1 John, the author being the same author of the Gospel of John. <clears throat> Chapter 1, go down to verse 5. Now I believe that John is thinking back to Hanukkah. I think he's thinking back to that time when Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Okay? And he says, This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you. Who's the him here? Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. He, he's saying, okay, what Jesus told us, we're now telling you. He says, that God is light. Okay, you, you see the connection there? You see the corollary? It says, and in him is no darkness at all. Okay? If we stay, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now this, this, this passage right here, this next verse is one that, that every time I read it, I have to pause for a moment. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. Okay, so here's the thing, folks. When you come to Christ, when you come to the cross and you give up your life and you accept Him as both Lord and Savior in your life, you become a child of the light. You come into the light that He is. Um, we, we are co-heirs with Christ, so what He is, we are. Okay, We are children of light. If we should, when we do sin, okay, it doesn't kick us out of heaven. But it does cause a problem with our fellowship with God. It hinders that relationship. Okay? It causes strain in that relationship. Okay? Now, if we left it there, we'd all be in trouble, right? But see, we go back to that verse, verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful. Okay, God says He is faithful. But He is also just. Why is God just to forgive us our sin? Because the price for that sin was paid. The, the price for those sins has been paid. All of it has been paid. So when we come to Him, He's not sitting there going, I ain't talking to you until you get it right. <laughs> la, 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 I can't hear you. He is waiting for us to come to confess that sin, that we can be the sin can be brought into the light, and then because that price has been paid, he is just to forgive us our sin. Wow. Isn't that incredible? Amen. Hallelujah. Because if he was if that wasn't the case, we'd all be in a world of hurt. Thanks be to God. Amen? Amen. So this celebration, this season, go, go to the last one. This season of Hanukkah or Hag Hagarim, let us celebrate with a full understanding the joy of walking in the light. Yeah, they dedicated the temple, but folks, we got something greater than that. Because there's going to be a day when God will make His tabernacle with us. It won't just be the presence of God hidden away in the Holy of Holies. He will be set up in Jerusalem and His very presence will be with us. He will make His dwelling with us. He's not going to come and walk in the cool of the evening like He did with Adam and Eve. He's not going to closet Himself away in the Holy of Holies like He did with the children of Israel. He's going to be in our presence. Amen. And we will be in His. Amen? Amen? Father, we thank You because You're awesome. And Father, even though we don't see all the stories and we don't have all the understanding, You're never idle. You're always working. 
You're always moving to accomplish your purposes, to fulfill your plans. And Father, you are so faithful to us. Father, as we celebrate the birth of your Son and, and all that that means, Father, let us not be distracted by the glitter, the lights, the, the wrapping, the bows, even the, the food and the feasting. All of these things, Father, are good, but not if they take the place of this, the, the whole purpose, the whole reason for this. Help us, Father, to rightly order these in our mind. Help us to rightly order them in our lives. That as we celebrate, we celebrate remembering that that babe that was laid in the manger had a destiny, had a plan, was going to the cross, and then would rise again. Father, that we might be righteous. And we thank you for this. We honor you today in Jesus' name. Amen.